and welcome to this short film on the Smithson Investment Trust, which this year celebrates its fifth anniversary. I'm Ian King, I'm the business presenter of Sky News, and I'm joined by the two portfolio managers, Simon Barnard and Will Morgan. Now, just to recap on how the fund has performed since its inception, well, up to June of this year, it had achieved an annualised net asset value return of 10.2%. That compares with the benchmark of 7%. Obviously, though, the last 12 months has been somewhat tougher with the trust moving to a discount to net asset value for the first time in its history. Simon and Will are going to talk us through the last five years and events more recently and the current investing environment. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Um, Simon, let me start with you just to remind everyone what the thinking was behind the Smithson Investment Trust. Well, the thinking really came from a few years ago when Terry Smith, was asked after several years of running the successful Fundsmith Equity Fund what companies had outperformed his fund since inception. And there were a whole load of companies that did outperform, but really the ones that he may possibly have owned all turned out to be small and mid-cap companies. So from that came the germ of the idea to launch a smaller mid-cap version of the larger Fundsmith Equity Fund. And the, the philosophy behind the fund is exactly the same that's the principles which underpin everything else that Terry has done at Fundsmith. That's right. It's a very simple three-step strategy. So we buy good companies, we don't overpay for those companies, and then the hardest bit, we try to do nothing. So ultimately, it's a concentrated, long-term buy-and-hold strategy where we, we try to buy and hold around 30 to 40 companies over 5 to 10 years or more, and then just let the quality businesses compound in value over time. So what are the main things you're looking for when you invest in a company? Well, ultimately, we're looking for companies that can generate, first and foremost, high returns on the capital they invest in their business and generate those returns in cash. And hopefully these companies will have lots of attractive opportunities to grow so that they can continue to invest that cash into their business at those high rates of return, which will create yet more growth in future. I think what's also important is that they uh, are able to protect their markets or their business from excessive competition so that those high rates of return on investment can remain over the long term and that they don't put themselves at risk by carrying high levels of debt or things like that. Uh, and, you know, the attractive thing about that is that there are companies out there that we see and we see actually quite a lot of opportunity today to find more businesses like this to research and to potentially add into the fund one day. Of course, uh, I mean, one of Terry's founding tenets is you never invest in companies which are dependent on things like the commodity markets. You know, they're price makers rather than price receivers. That's exactly right. There are several sectors actually that we don't look at and commodity is certainly one of them but also many sectors that are very involved or require leverage to make good returns. So that would include uh, banks, that would include real estate, some utilities as well. So there are several sectors that we just don't even start looking at because we know that over long periods of time they just don't generate good shareholder value. Well as I said in the introduction the last 12 months have been pretty tough. For the first time in its history, the trust has been trading at a discount to net asset value. Talk me through what happened there. Well, initially, I'd say the biggest impact on the portfolio was um, the change in interest rate expectations in the market from, from the ultra low interest rates that we had previously to what is now actually more of a normalized environment, historically speaking. Um, and so during that transition period, a lot of valuations of almost all assets actually was re-rated downwards um, but especially that impacted small and mid-cap equities but i have to say while macroeconomics was probably the biggest factor it wasn't the only one i do believe we made some mistakes as well and so while you could say that it was almost impossible for us to outperform last year given the situation i do think that our performance could have been slightly better but you know these situations come and go we don't try to predict macroeconomics economic environments because we don't think that we're able to. So instead, we just plug away, executing the same strategy, looking for high quality companies with the robust business models that can see them through all types of economic cycles and particularly that can survive the low points in the market that we see ourselves in today. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, well, as you mentioned, I mean, and obviously the trust did go to a discount, which you pointed out. 
and that sort of happened I guess just before the first half last year so around April time um, I mean what's quite interesting is if you look at investment trusts in equities in general you're now seeing levels of discounts of investment trusts that are as large as they've been in the COVID pandemic but also the financial crisis so it's been a widespread issue not just related to us but certainly since we went to that discount the board has elected to actually start buying back shares last year uh, and that's something that continues to this day. You did say something very interesting though which was with the benefit of hindsight there were things that you wouldn't have done I mean hindsight's a wonderful thing but but where specifically might you might have done things differently? Well I mean I, I guess the first thing I should say is that overall with the strong five-year track record um, it does tend to suggest that good investment decisions were made but when I do think back to our mistakes, they really tended to be in that period in 2021 when valuations got ahead of themselves. And we did during that period, when valuations in certain companies got towards the upper end of our comfort levels, we started trimming some positions. And, you know, in our buy and hold strategy, that is actually quite rare for us to do. So I think that fact should have given us pause for thought um, and perhaps on contemplation, perhaps we should have been selling out of those positions completely and that would have saved some performance uh, last year. What stopped you from doing that? Was it because you had an attachment to those particular investments? No, ultimately, I think it's because they were only at our upper limit. And because we have a long term outlook for these companies and many of them are fast growing, you know, when you extrapolate this fast growth of in our case, what we look at is free cash flow. When you extrapolate that over 10 years, um, towards the upper end of our comfort still gives you a decent return over the next 10 years, but it's not stellar. Um, and I think it was that point that we, there were other opportunities potentially in the market that we could have rotated into and given up on some of those faster growing, higher valuation names that would have saved a little bit of performance. But the key point was the overall philosophy underpinning the investment strategy remained unchanged. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, some of the individual uh, strong performers for you over the last 12 months. What, what, what uh, have you been particularly pleased with? Well, I, I mean, our best performer overall has been Fortinet. So this is a US cybersecurity company. Um, and it's really down to two factors. One, obviously, there's been enormous demand for its cybersecurity products. Um, but I think we were also able to buy it at a point when its fundamentals were improving in terms of its um, margins and returns due to the additional scale it was benefiting from in that uh, growth of revenue. So it was really that combination of very strong end markets plus improving fundamentals. And, um, and I think another interesting example actually is, um, is Equifax, which is a US consumer credit bureau. And this again, it is a very good company with strong fundamentals, but it did suffer more from macroeconomic headwinds than, say, Fortinet did. But it still performed very well overall because we were able to buy it at a point just after it had a major um, data breach. So that meant that we were able to basically buy it at very attractive valuation. And despite all the investment internally that had to go on in that company to fix the security issues, it still performed very well. So what that really taught us is that if you can find a great company, but buy it when it's going through a small glitch in its business operations, then you can have very outsized performance. And I think one other group of companies that we also found did well are kind of serial acquiring businesses. So, I mean, maybe a good example, because it recently went into the FTSE 100 is Diploma. Um, that more than doubled since when we launched the fund. And what we really like about those businesses is we always talk about companies with high returns that can invest in their businesses. But there are lots of companies that don't necessarily put all the cash they generate into the core business. And I think with the serial acquirers, they do, uh, obviously mainly by our acquisition, but they have a track record of being able to do that incredibly well. So, you know, obviously, Diploma has done particularly well, companies like Halmer we own. Um, but I think that spurred us on to maybe look at some more companies in that area. And it's also quite interesting because, especially with the change in interest rates that we've talked about, 
you know, that is making some of the price tags on these acquisitions that companies might do potentially get a little bit lower, which is perhaps improving the returns that they'll make in future. So, you know, some good examples of companies we've added in that area because of this have been things like ad tech uh, in Sweden, which we bought after the sell-off last year, but also IDEX in the US, and they all follow that kind of similar business model. Uh, and that's something we've sort of learned we quite like as a result of managing the fund over the last five years. I mean, it's obviously free cash flow generation that underpins most of your investment decisions, but it's a really interesting point you make there on the acquiring companies. I mean, Harmer and Diploma both carried on making acquisitions right through the sort of downturn that accompanied the pandemic. They, there, was a ma there was management there which had the sort of courage of convictions mm -hmm. to carry on growing the business. Very rare. Yeah, and I think I think one of the great things about buying good quality companies, and, and one of the things we want is the companies to have good balance sheets as well as all the opportunities for growth and investment. It means that when times get tough, they can actually continue to do what they've always been doing. And that's when often the greatest advantage comes. And so it was interesting when we went through the COVID pandemic, most of the companies we own talked about wanting to leave that particular crisis in a stronger position than, than when they went into it. And in general, they were able to do that. Um, but we've seen the same thing since. And I think, especially with supply chain disruptions, all those kinds of things, all of which require investment by companies to keep in operation. You know, our companies have had the wherewithal to be able to keep doing that. And one of the things we hear most of all from our companies is that they continue to take market share from their competitors. and. While you can never predict the macro environment, we can't ask more than that they continue to take share in their markets. And that's been encouraging in general. And Equifax, really a very good example of that as well. I mean, a company with an absolutely entrenched market share that's very, very powerful. Absolutely. And that's stood it in good stead when times have got a little tougher, particularly around this period. I mean, um, a large part of their business is generating credit reports for mortgage lending. And so you can imagine in a period of high interest rates, uh, fewer housing transactions and fewer mortgage approvals, that has been quite a headwind. But because of their entrenched position and the uh, a level of data that they have, um, it just means that they continue to take market share even in difficult times. You touched just now on selling assets and you've done, you gave a couple of examples there. I mean, obviously the strategy is to buy and hold. What informs your decisions when you do have to sell? I mean, I think our sell process is going to be really one of three things. Either something has fundamentally changed the company, management does something we don't like, or it's valuation. I would say of the three, valuation is likely to be the rarer reason. And, and Simon kind of alluded to some of that earlier. Um, obviously, we've got a really great business that should be able to compound in value into, over time. You know, there will be times in its history where valuation might be a little higher, might be a little lower. I think if you're going to sell to get out, you've A, got to time that well, but you've also got to time the decision to get back in again so you don't miss out on that long-term growth. And I think that's just too hard for us to do, so we tend not to do that, although never say never. Um, and therefore, it tends to be more likely that we'll sell if management has done something that we don't like, and often that is allocating capital poorly. Um, and where we start to see returns drop because of management actions, that leads us to be concerned and we often take action. And certainly there have been some examples of that. Yeah, actually, there, uh, one good example of that is ANSYS, which we sold last year. It's a US software company. Um, and funnily enough, it, exactly that, it, management had changed the way that they allocated capital within the business. So, for example, in the three years before we bought the company, management spent around $30 million a year on acquisitions. In the four years after we bought the company, they spent an average of $500 million a year on acquisitions. But unfortunately, these acquisitions were not at all good value. So it just meant that they were spending a lot of money and getting very little in terms of revenue and growth of earnings from these new businesses. And so what we observed was that when we bought the company, it was generating about a return on investor capital of 30%. By the time we sold it, that had dropped down to 12. Obviously, uh, from the inception, the fund was set up to invest in small and mid-cap companies. You do have some companies in the portfolio now that have decidedly uh, sort of veering towards large cap. Would you necessarily offload them if they hit a certain size? There's no given size that would automatically make us sell them. So 
because really the whole point is to own these companies while they continue compounding value so we would never want to cut that off at an arbitrary number but what you might find over time is that as these companies get bigger it's harder for them to compete their way into the portfolio because of their growth and margin characteristics relative to the exciting smaller companies that we've got on offer to us. So it is, I think, more of a case of natural rotation out of those larger companies as they get bigger into the smaller ones that will mean that we do eventually sell them. You do have a relatively small number of companies in the portfolio. Why is that? Well, in general, I think we believe that you can get adequate diversification from owning um, not too high a number of businesses. So I think once you get into the 20s and beyond, that does a lot of the job for you. And I think we've always said that, you know, we want to own businesses that we can truly understand um, and that have really high quality. And, you know, there aren't that many high quality businesses that attracted valuations out there. You know, our investable universe, it's currently 87 companies there or thereabouts. Um, that is, you know, all the companies we see as being potentially good enough to buy. And, you know, we own somewhere in the sort of low 30s, it fluctuates a little bit. Um, so I think, you know, that is really when you overlay valuation onto these companies, uh, it, you know, that's really the sweet spot of opportunity that we find. Does that ever frustrate you, the fact that your investable universe is relatively small? That, or does it, is it an advantage that it means you can actually scrutinise the performance of these businesses more deeply? Oh, I think I think it's an advantage. I mean, what we the way we sort of think about it, it's a bit like having a squad, which is the investable universe, and you know from that you pick the team. Um, but there is rotation in the squad, and we are always looking at new companies that we can add in. So you know we have an in-depth, bottom-up research process. We're always looking for new companies that meet the quality criteria we talked about, um, and we will do in-depth models and notes on those. I think what's really interesting at the moment is that. You know, often we follow these companies, we'll add new ones, um, and we wait for opportunities where valuation looks attractive and potentially add them into the fund. I think with all the dislocation we've seen uh, in the last year or so, that's providing quite a lot of interesting opportunity. Um, and therefore, we've kind of redoubled our efforts a little bit to increase that investable universe, uh, because there are more companies now that not only could be good enough to enter, but actually at attractive enough valuations to get in the portfolio quite quickly. Um, so, you know, our investable universe has actually grown since we first launched. Um, and actually in the last 12 months, we've added more companies into it than in all the prior years for that since launch um, combined. So, you know, that's an indication of the kind of interesting opportunities we're seeing out there. So when you've been tracking a, a business, when it's been on your radar, how, how rapidly would you move? I mean, if if there were certain things that you were still perhaps uncertain about, but the valuation suddenly got a lot more compelling, would, would that be enough to make you move? Yes, I mean, we've done it in the past in just a, a couple of weeks um, of it coming into our coverage, um, feeling confident in our knowledge of the business combined with a very attractive valuation level and uh, ultimately executing to get that into the portfolio. What about the size of a stake that you might take in a particular business. Are you agnostic on that? We would only ever go up to 10% in terms of a stake, but really it's dominated by the position size that we want in our fund. So if we want a large position in a smaller company, we'll just end up with a bigger stake as long as it doesn't go above 10. But in all honesty, anything above 7%, uh, we're starting to get a bit itchy and we've never gone above 8 I was struck by something that you said just now, that uh, you are seeing a lot more opportunities, valuations are becoming a lot more attractive. I mean, we're at an interesting point now in, in equity markets everywhere, really, because it feels like we're, we're approaching the point where monetary tightening around the world has, has reached its peak. For how long do you think valuations will remain compelling? That's very difficult to say. I mean, potentially not very long because as soon as the market has a line of sight to the end of the hiking, then we could be off to the races. But on the flip side, you know, that uncertainty may remain for some time, particularly if we go into recession. So even if rates have peaked and we go into recession, that uh, negative sentiment around the economy will continue for some time. So it's quite difficult to say, but certainly I think we're nearer the end than the beginning. And I think the other thing is that 
what I find interesting at the moment is that it's quite different depending on what industry you're in, maybe even what company you are, because you've seen so many odd movements in things, whether it be surges in demand during the pandemic that have hugely unwound, whether or not it's supply chain disruptions causing hugely odd demand patterns, depending on where you serve in a particular supply chain. Um, and that does create what Simon talked about earlier, glitches for some companies, perhaps, which provide opportunity, um, which may not be there for long when they appear, but they may appear for other companies and other industries as well. So we, you know, there's always something interesting to keep an eye on. Obviously, you construct a portfolio that enables you to sleep at night, but what doesn't? Well, I think there's I, one of the things we've learned is that in portfolio management, it's maybe quite easy to focus on the investment decision and then watching something do well. The reality is, is there are always going to be companies that don't do as well as you thought or suffer in a particular situation. And those are the things that take up most of your focus, um, which is challenging sometimes because it means you're always worrying about something. And we indeed do that. What I think is interesting is that it, it's how we react when companies get into those problems. You know, a good example um, of some of the recent issues that have been going on in the market and how they've affected companies badly is, let's say, fever tree in the UK um, with things like cost inflation, higher freight rates, you know, a company that makes bottled tonic water mainly in the UK and ships it to some of its biggest markets worldwide, which are now its biggest market is actually the US. That's led to a huge surge in costs over the last couple of years, uh, which has greatly depressed its margin and caused profits to go down. Now, obviously, that is a source of concern to us. But actually, when we speak to the company, do our own work on the situation, you know, we have stuck with it. And the reason we stick with it is because you know, we believe a lot of these cost pressures to ultimately be transitory and I think many of them are now going into reverse which could actually mean that these margins start to expand again. I think the second thing we look at is really to understand from the management how they're managing through it and when we looked at that particular situation we felt that there wasn't really anything different that they should be doing and they continue to invest for the long term and I think finally perhaps the most important thing is that the business continued to grow its stop line and it you know, back to our earlier point about companies taking market share, they continue to take market share in most of their key markets. So I think that is one where it's been tough. You know, we worried about it a lot, but the outlook from here, we hope, should be a little rosier. Yeah, I mean, it's the same management and they're, they're backing themselves still. They're, they're embarking on new product launches across the United States. I mean, that's, a, that's quite a bold thing for a business like that to be doing. Yeah, and it's back to the point we mentioned earlier is that this is a company that for most of its life hasn't really had any debt and has cash on hand. And I think that is good because it's a business that is able to continue investing. It's not essential that it has to preserve and maximize its cash flow just to stay afloat. And we like companies that can take those long-term decisions. And you know, if we're right that a lot of these cost pressures prove to be transitory, you know, hopefully when we look back on this situation, they'll have been doing the right thing, which is to grow and nurture what we think is a very attractive brand across the world. And, you know, we uh, we remain long term shareholders for that. Now, speaking of debt, so obviously the advantage of an investment trust is you can gear up compared with uh, obviously closed end funds that can't. You've avoided doing that for the history of the of the fund. Why is that? Yes. Well, I mean, the investment trust is able to gear up by 15 percent, um, but it is a board decision. Uh, and the board has discussed it in the past, and I think related to the share buyback that Will mentioned earlier. Um, but ultimately, debt does uh, bring some cost with it. Uh, it also can lead to the trust overall becoming more volatile, which I think many people don't want to see. Um, and so because we've been able to make cash available within the portfolio to conduct these buybacks, the board ultimately decided that gearing wasn't necessary. So it's interesting that you're finding more quality companies in which to invest. Is the current market environment conducive to that? Yes, I think we've got a great opportunity now. So not only are we finding more high quality names to follow, but actually this low point in market sentiment is offering great valuations for us to get them into the portfolio as well. So, for example, 
So far this year, we've already bought four new companies. And not only are they great companies that we've been able to buy at very attractive prices, but interestingly, they are all businesses that are very different to the businesses that we already own in the fund. So this basically means that the diversification of the fund, which Will mentioned earlier, is improving as well as the quality of the fund, which suggests that the fund should be able to perform well through different economic scenarios in the future. Yeah, I mean, one of the companies we did actually get to add uh, which is, I think, unusual versus the kind of companies that we bought before, uh, is a company called Exponent in the US. Uh, it's a consulting business in its simplest term. Uh, it's just under £4 billion market cap. Uh, but what they consult into is things that have gone wrong, and they look into why. So, for example, when the uh, Challenger space shuttle blew up or when Piper Alpha happened, they go in to look at the root causes of these uh, disasters. So they often are involved in cases of uh, litigation and things like that, but also they increasingly now help companies try and avoid being sued themselves by consulting on their future product design and things like that. Obviously, a business like that is not hugely correlated to the economic cycle, which is one of the things we really like about it. Uh, but as a result, you know, despite its amazing track record, it doesn't really have many major sell-offs. Um, but luckily for us, it did actually have one of its largest ever sell-offs this year, uh, and that gave us an opportunity to buy into the shares. So, you know, I think that's a good example of where we've been able to add diversification uh, and that opportunity arose in the current environment. So it really means that we continue to execute on the strategy that has been proven over a long period of time, but the current environment is providing a lot of exciting opportunities, which is just making us very optimistic. An upbeat note on which to end. Simon, Will, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.